Hey, I'm Lisa Joy, co-creator of Westworld and director of this episode. And I'm Jonathan Nolan, the co-creator or vice co-creator, as the case may be. Uh, and I co-wrote the episode with Gina Atwater. And this is Notes on a Scene from Westworld. William, my boy. Where the hell have you been? How long has it been? Longer than we thought. So then, let's get me the fuck out of here. No, I don't think so. This episode is very special to us because you wrote it with Gina, Gina who is amazing and brilliant, alas, not here today. And, uh, and I directed it. Yes, so. you did. <laughs> this is the fourth episode from the second season. It's called Riddle of the Sphinx. In many ways, this episode almost didn't happen uh, for me. I had wanted to direct for a long time, but the circumstances felt insane uh, because I was writing the season with Jonah while I was pregnant. Then, uh, in order to start prepping with this, I, I had our lovely baby. Uh, but like four minutes before. <laughs> yeah, I had like two weeks before I knew we would be prepping this episode while also writing all the other episodes and you know doing a lot of stuff and it just seemed kind of kind of crazy and masochistic. Um, you know, I told Joan I'm like I don't think this is I don't think this is my year to do it. I think it's I think it's going to be too much for you know our family. Um, and he basically refused to let me back out. And he said he just wanted to make sure that I had this chance. And so he uh, took care of the kids uh, for me uh, while I was doing this. You know, you've definitely changed more diapers than I have. I'm he, good he's very sweet. And he helped take care of the room and helped produce the episodes. Uh, and it was really, he was unwavering in his support. Uh, which was which was very was very cool of you. Um, uh, even though I might have it had was, doubts, he it didn't. It was very cool. <laughs> uh, it was very tactical. I was very tired <laughs> after the birth. <laughs> so this is the opening shot from the episode. It was one of those things where I took some liberties. It wasn't actually scripted, but I wanted to start in a way that would be immediately very intriguing and mysterious. It's a space we've never seen before. We're used to the kind of warmth of the outdoors in the Old West or the world of the technicians underground. But this is a sort of private domicile in a very strangely circular shaped room. So I designed the shot. I wanted everybody to take a moment and reorient themselves and wonder where they were as the camera traveled around this room, exploring the space as our hosts were forced to explore the space of the park for a season without knowing where we were going, which is why I liked pulling backwards so that we as the audience felt our vantage point constricted in the same way as the host. And you're not allowed to roam freely with your gaze you are forced to experience the room with the camera, seeing only what the camera allows you to see until you find the subject of the room. So the shot is basically a somewhat complicated one -er. So without cutting, we basically started on the record player in this extreme close-up of it. And it's such a strange record, it's white, and the markings on it are unfamiliar. So we started from there, not really knowing exactly what we were looking at until we pulled up all the way and we saw that it was a record. Then what I loved was, as the record turns, we ourselves kind of follow a similar rotation around the room. So the camera, which was on an arm, the base was here, and the arm kind of rigged out to here. And first it pulled up, and then we just kind of traveled slowly around the room, lingering for moments more on certain objects that I wanted to really establish as symbolic and kind of essential towards for the scene. By the way, the entire time we were actually playing the song, which was nice because it gave a sense of musicality to the flow of the camera and the ways in which it would linger in certain moments, almost like we were dancing with the set. So we stopped first at the hourglass, which gave us a sense of time and the ways in which it was running out. Then we circled around to here, to this goldfish, a very special goldfish that I requested 
also not scripted. Is that the goldfish or is that the carrot? Okay, that one's the goldfish. Um, Very expensive goldfish. I came in at budget, so don't get mad at me. Under I was budget. fine. Under budget. So as it turns out, my desire to have this fish as a kind of symbolic element of Mr. Delos and his confinement in this chamber it was a lovely little poetic flourish I thought I'd add. And then I got the numbers in. And it turns out this goldfish, who I named Kurt, um, is incredibly expensive. He came with like an entourage. Oh, an entourage. He has a wrangler. You have to have the animal. It's uh, a trainer. Yeah, you have. You, there's a lot of people there. But after a full day worth of shooting, I realized I did not have the budget to afford Kurt any longer. So I shot him out, as you do sometimes. I shot him out in all the wide shots and some. Did you keep Ed waiting? Yeah, I just, I just waited. <laughs> how, did that, how did that conversation go? I was like, Ed, Sorry, the Mr. fish Harris. is tired. <laughs> the fish, the fish needs to go home. Yeah, we tried to shoot him out in as many of the close-up shots as we needed. And so what happened was our art department held a contest about who could carve the best Kurt. And one of the geniuses there used a carrot and constructed a perfect model of Kurt, propped carrot Kurt up in the tank with a toothpick. And so in any shot, you may be seeing real Kurt or carrot Kurt, but hopefully it's impossible to tell. <laughs> So we're continuing our circle. So this circle moves all the way around. We clock the book, Vonnegut. Kurt Vonnegut is one of both our favorites and has made lots of little cameos throughout the season and seasons uh, as a sort of um, illusion and reference in all the uh, episodes. And then we kind of went around a little bit more and we found this room. Now in the room, what I really wanted to do is you hear this sound, it's like and it's the sound of someone pedaling. You only see feet, you don't see who it is yet. You see a hand reach for some cigarettes, uh, but still without revealing the man, and you see the same hand kind of turn on the water of the faucet. The cigarettes, by the way, are named Grillo's, after my DP, so congratulations, John, you made it into the episode. And uh, finally, you go all the way around and you end where you started, on the record player, and you see the music cuts off, as this hand replaces the needle, uh, takes the needle off, and the camera moved up. And for the first time, you see the inhabitant of this strange room. And it is Delos, Peter Mullen. Oh, one thing that I should add, he lights his cigarette while, you know, right after we hear the last strands of Playing With Fire by the Rolling Stones which ordinarily, Jonah chooses a lot of the music in the show. Uh, but this one I chose uh, just because of the symbolism that I knew uh, would be occurring and recurring within this episode. So we shot all the stuff that was scripted. You know, he eats a little, he um, brushes his teeth. But, you know, it, it came really as a collaboration with Peter because on the day, I just asked him, I said, you know, we have all this stuff, but really you're a man who's going about his life with the total hubris and self-assurance that he is the master of his own destiny, that he is the one calling the shots, and that no one is watching. So what could be more invasive than doing all the things that we actually would do when totally assured of our own privacy, you know? And those things just become more personal, right? They become masturbation, taking a piss, dancing, you know, an expression of almost goofy joy that I thought was really humanizing because he's this scion of industry, you know, and it's easy to imagine him as being heartless and, you know, just avaricious all the time. But I think when you look at people for who they are, we contain these really elemental, beautiful and common building blocks. And dance was the purest expression of it I could find. Yeah. We hadn't worked with Peter before. We wanted to work with him on the pilot a couple of years beforehand. We couldn't make it work. It was your first day shooting the episode. So yeah. It's kind of a gutsy thing to do, to spend a day and show up and ask him to dance. But it was fantastic. We'd, we'd yeah. seen the character before, ultimately the way it cut together in episode two, where he's introduced to us as this street fighter who's built an empire underneath him. But you don't get a sense of him as a person. And that's what's so, so brilliant about what you did was in the first two minutes of film, you've completely changed my perception of who this character was. By the time we get into the scene proper, I now feel completely differently about this character than I did when I first met him. 
So here Delos hears that he has a visitor, right? And we come to know from his reaction, oh, that's, that's unusual and also long awaited. He's impatient for it. He walks over there, studies himself for a bit. You know, the idea for me was, it's like he's studying himself, which at first just seems, okay, maybe he's studying himself to see if there's, you know, anything on his shirt or, you know, just glancing at his reflection. But there's a little something deeper to it. And you see it too when he's dancing and he kind of dances up to the mirror and stares for a beat too long before shrugging something off and walking on. And I wanted to play with that notion that there might be somebody hiding within ourselves that we're not totally familiar with yet. And then in walks Jimmy Simpson. William, boy. It allows the entry of Jimmy to really come as a kind of surprise. You know, as he's studying himself, this person walks in and it takes him a moment, and it takes us a moment, to register who it could possibly be. It's good to see you again, Jim. Thank fuck for that. Most important thing these cretins will give me is grapefruit juice. <laughs> the choreography of this scene and a lot of the scenes within this room between Jimmy and Ed was really planned out beforehand. You know, within the script, they talk about how the experiment is basically repeated again and again and again without variation because they're trying to test the subject. So I thought it would be ideal if the camera in each of these iterations followed a very, very similar path, same as the actors would follow, follow a similar path, and only deviate when that deviation was meaningful, when it was a break with the experiment itself or some form of aberration. We also did a, f a fun thing in post-production, which I don't think anyone has actually caught us on yet. We spilled the, <laughs> yeah. sec the secret. You're going to spill the secret? Why not? Yeah, go uh, for it. So we did a number of things. Jimmy did some amazing things to bring his performance in line with Ed. But what, what we ultimately did in post-production with this scene um, was we got Ed to do all three of the scenes in a vocal performance. And we took his vocal performance, and our incredible sound team was able to take Jimmy's captured on-set vocal performance and begin to maneuver it into the same space, one scene at a time, very slowly into Ed's vocal range. And then we went one step further um, and started taking syllables from Ed's performance and actually just cutting them into Jimmy's performance. So if you watch Jimmy's performance on here, some of the words are his and some of them are actually Ed's vocal performance for the whole scene. It's good to see you again, Jim. Been a long time, Jim. Good to see you again. It's so performance-based, the scene, that I wanted to be able to spend my time, you know, working with the actors and allowing the actors to just do their thing, to kind of slip fluidly into the scene itself and their characters. And I tried to also make it so that we had a three-camera setup where there was always a camera pointed at each actor in addition to a two-shot. So there's one camera that is over here, one camera that's over here, and one camera that was over here. So I have an over the shoulder for each of them, and then I had one two shot. There were a couple things that I did in terms of camera work that I thought would be interesting in the evolution of this scene. Peter Mullen, I shot from a slightly lower angle so that he looked more imposing and bigger in frame. Jimmy, I shot him more from a kind of a tiny bit higher up or level so that he just looked sort of standard in the screen or a little bit lower so that it, it kind of reflected the power dynamic between the two men. You're looking up to Mr. Delos and you're just kind of looking at Jimmy. You know, you haven't really realized fully what's going on within this chamber. And so I stayed on one side of the line, really just focusing on performance and not doing too much tricky camera work. Uh, just wanting to get to know the characters and sit in and sink into their performances. I think I went tighter on the actors than is sometimes uh, chosen by other directors because there was so much happening that in those spaces between the words, between the dialogue, where a little flicker here or a little darting up of the eyes there would say so much about their views of the world and each other. And I just wanted to make sure I captured that. It's about capturing your frame of mind, your mood, your sense of humor. I own a biotechnology company, and I'm dying of a disease whose research I defunded 15 years ago. I think my sense of humor is fucking intact. Part of how 
uh, Jimmy's character, William, would convince his father-in-law to, to do this would be Delos' own fear of death. Because it's the one thing that comes for everybody. It doesn't matter how much money you have, doesn't matter what technologies you've built, everybody dies. It's really the last frontier, the last stop. So much of the season, this season, is a bit of a commentary, not just on what's happening in artificial intelligence, but what's happening right now in technology. Um, the, the fact that the park has an ostensible model, which is that it's a place to go have your kicks with robot cowboys, but an, an actual business model, which is that they're watching you, they're watching everything you do in an effort to learn as much about human behavior as they can, but ultimately with the end goal of reproducing you. So it kind of felt beautiful, delicious to us that we could take the character of the tech mogul and trap him in both his own ambitions and his own fear of death, inverting the structure of the first season where the audience is kind of watching the hosts, hopefully with some empathy, but also with uh, a slight attitude of, oh, they're not in on the joke, they don't get it, and then turn that around on the audience in the second season. We don't get it, and we don't get the devil's bargain that we've forged with technology. So by the third iteration of this cycle with Mr. Dallas, you've kind of become used to the little loop that he's on. You know, he makes his coffee, but this time, interestingly, he doesn't spill the milk. He's actually progressing. The fidelity of his coffee is getting more and more accurate. There are less glitches. Now that the audience is aware of his circumstances, I was allowed to play a little bit with camera moves. So this swoop around as he walks to the mirror from the other side was just a wonderful way to kind of break the pattern and say, now you're in on the joke, guys. This is him. And as he watches himself, thinking he's having this private moment, we're watching him from the other side of it watch himself. We cut back in so that the same syntax is occurring. But this time when the door opens, Dallas doesn't even recognize his visitor. Who the fuck are you? It takes uh, Ed reintroducing himself to understand and start to really fathom what's been happening. William? Ed could sell me booze any day with his posturing and holding it would this be bottle. A good I mean, look at him. My gosh, it's ridiculous. Excellent bourbon <laughs> I know. The interesting thing about this bottle that he's holding here is we actually we went through and designed three separate labels. The idea was that over time that vintage would be getting older. So we showed the number of years it was aged in the label each year. And speaking of things that age well, well, thank fuck for that. Most important thing these cretins will give me is great for juice. On these days, I popped out in selective quadrants. We would lay down some track here. Later on, there's a shot over there. I think the mirror is somewhere right here. And that's where we see Delos examining himself and, and the camera kind of moved there. We also had right past this wall outside, we laid down track and did a little bit of a move from outside the glass there. That's the shot that picks up Delos as he stands and starts to freak out and call for Logan. So there were three major places in this scene where we popped out. And our cameraman loved it because they were on a dolly that went fully circular around the whole thing. And they were just pushing themselves <laughs> around, having a time in their lives. It was great, great ride. Now, I started this scene again with a similar three camera setup. Again, you know, a couple over the shoulder shots here, and I did have a two shot. The, the difference being, you know, we're looking subtly. I'm trying to learn some shit. <laughs> I don't know what the fuck to do with three cameras. I hate shooting with I three love, cameras. I love, he hates shooting with three cameras. I love it. I never know what to do with the third camera. So, you know, the camera from this side is angled up a little bit so that you're seeing up at Ed. And this one is angled a little bit down. I also incorporated profile shots for a couple of these things where you're looking square on at the profiles of the actors as they kind of lurch back and forth in these subtle movements in their chairs. It gave a feel of kind of two matadors coming and clashing and when you kind of cut it together, I thought it was a nice escalation of tension. There were two things that I relished about this scene. One was the ability to pop out of the room occasionally and get that air into the scene. I thought that even though there was repetition in these loops, there was still a freshness visually that you could keep unfolding new angles and new elements of coverage. Well, what's great about it is you also feel in the first scene that it's very personal. You feel very connected to Delos. 
And then as the scenes go by, you feel less connected to him and it starts to take on this kind of timeless confrontational feeling. <sighs> what are you doing? Oh, I, I was arming the camera up for you. Oh yeah, okay, yeah, 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 yeah. Okay, good. I'm your best boy. He is my best boy. The thing that I was also really excited for was at a certain point in the scene when Delos realizes, now he's already realized just by virtue of the fact that Jimmy has aged so much that he's been here a lot, right? But he thinks that it's going swimmingly and he's about to get out of this fish tank and, you know, carouse and own the world again. Right out of the gate in the first season, again, the audience is looking at the host and, and kind of not sneering at them a little bit, but feeling a little superior because they don't understand they're doing the same thing every day. It did occur to us more than once as we would take our kids to school and drive into work and get a cup of coffee and go to the bathroom because we didn't really know what to say to the room and then go in the room and then leave after 20 minutes and take a phone call and then go back. That, you know, obviously humans live their days in loops as well, but this was the most dramatic inversion of that idea where Delos thinks he's checked into a care facility in, uh, in California and then the audience is a little ahead of him as well as he starts to realize that that's not at all where he is anymore. And then... I'm beginning to think that this whole enterprise was a mistake. And that's when the other shoe drops. That's when we realize, well, that's certainly when Peter Mullen realizes, my God, I'm in a prison and I'm never going to get out and I have no power. I entrusted you with my empire, my daughter, my whole life and afterlife, and you are going to screw me royally. And in that moment when the tables fully turn, that's when I cross the line moving behind can we His talk shoulder. about the line? Can I talk about the line? Really? Yeah. This is amazing. He's going to do it. Stage line clap. You draw an imaginary line from his eye to his eye. That's your stage line. That's the eye line connection between the two actors. And your cameras all really want to stay on one side of that line. One character is always facing right to left, and the other character is facing left to right. And the audience sutures the scene together and understands who's talking to who. It's fairly straightforward. But the stage line is vitally important, and there's an enormous power in crossing over it. You can cross it, but crossing it means you need to actually physically pick up the camera and bring it across the line. You need to bring it behind one actor or in front of the other one. You need to see their eyes go from left to right, so now they're looking at the other side of it. And if you save crossing the line for an important moment in the scene, you can create a nice psychological impact in the viewer. It helps to underscore what they're feeling. The shoe is on the other foot now. The power dynamic has completely shifted and the world that you thought you understood is totally different. The angle with which we shoot Delos becomes really ratcheted up there and you feel it oppressing him. It drifts from his hand on his knee, which now the shake and the tremor is much more noticeable as he gets more and more anxious. Meanwhile, our view of the man is still level and calm as he sits relaxed in his chair. One of the fun things about the way you constructed all of these scenes is that you're in studio mode through, through all of these scenes. Studio mode basically means your camera's on a tripod or it's on a dolly. It's not, it's not, uh, it's very controlled, it's surgical. And when we talked in the first season um, for the pilot, it, we wanted the feeling from the camera to feel um, like it was empathizing with the host from the beginning, that it was more robotic, more surgical, more precise. Even that first shot in the roundabout when we go from the record and we pull up, you could have done that on Steadicam, but it wouldn't have had the same machine-like uh, cadence. And I thought that was really important because it's an experiment, right? And it has to be kept clinical and logical and kind of cold. And so even though Delos is doing all these kind of free-ranging and very human things, the eye observing him is clinical and detached. In addition to the sort of antiseptic camera moves, we looked a lot at, throughout, throughout the series, we've looked a lot at 2001 and Kubrick for that sort of cold, pristine gaze and camera move. And that's what really influenced the style of shooting uh, Delos when he's in there under observation. We should terminate, sir. Sir. Leave him. Might be useful to observe his degradation over the next few days. It's funny, when people talk about consciousness, and that was one of the themes of the first season, but another theme is, is sanity. At one point in the finale, Jeffrey Wright's character talks about the idea that most states of consciousness are insane. You know, what humans consider sane behavior is actually a really narrow range 
behaviors. There's a convention to it. You know, sometimes you feel as a human being, you know, you, you're sort of aware of how, how little freedom we actually have in our behavior before people start to think that it's odd or off. We were interested in the idea of if you left consciousness alone in a box long enough, what would happen to it? And it felt inevitable that, that, that sanity would be the piece that slips away. And it's, it's a bit of a, I think, a little bit of a cautionary tale. I mean, one of the things that you wonder about with this quest for immortality is, well, what becomes of a mind that's left alive forever? Um, and is what we define as sanity genuinely sane, or is it just what we all agree on? There's a lot of stuff that happens in this world that seems sometimes quite insane, and yet we're all quite comfortable with it. Um, so mm. what happens if your mind is left to rot in a little box long enough? And what I thought was interesting about the sequence was that it feels like we look at Dallas and see the insanity, but when you listen to what he's saying, he might well have glimpsed something that's actually more true than, than what we found. So in the design of the chamber, you know, we worked with Howard Cummings, our incredible production designer. We went through all of these different schemes for how the room could work. It was just supposed to be one window and you would look in at, you know, a walled room from a window of kind of two-way glass. And I was like, oh, we've seen that before. It looks like a police interrogation chamber kind of thing. And so then we went to, well, maybe a couple of the walls are, are glass, you know, and you have this maybe like a square <laughs> or a rectangle somewhere and, and they're looking in from two sides. And ultimately what it became was, okay, well, why don't we make the entire thing glass, you know, and so that we can really trace every single motion of this person. You know, we always talk about the host living in loops. It immediately just struck me as, wouldn't it be beautiful if there was a sort of circular design to this room? Like he's caught in the physical manifestation of a loop. It also to me evokes not just a clock face, but also the panopticon. There's a prison in England where they, they designed the whole thing in a circle so that all the cells face a central watchtower so that the prisoners understood that they could be watched at any given moment. This is the 19th century, so no cameras. Um, and it's a kind of horrible, horrible feeling. Um, <laughs> Healthy. Someone's in there. You know, later on, Jeffrey Wright, playing Bernard, has this epiphany uh, about what his true purpose was. He remembers these drone hosts getting murdered. And when we shot that scene, I had Jeffrey stand in the middle of this giant room and pivot in the same kind of clockwise motion that the camera in the opening shot of the episode pivoted because there he's kind of an observer to everything that's happening around him and he's caught in his own loop. It's this kind of motion, I think, that helps to unite the common plight of some of our otherwise seemingly uh, at odds characters. So we're gonna do a lightning round of objects that we see with Jonah ready to clear ready. this. All right, ready? Here we go, doors open. Oh, those are the shelves. In there, all the objects, layer after layer of the items in Dallas's room. So you get the sinking feeling that that little fire that started the last round happens a lot and then they just repopulate the room. What happened to all the cooked goldfish? The, we could not afford cooked goldfish. Mm -hmm. They wouldn't have been real goldfish. Doors open, lots of flashing lights. This, this lighting scheme was really fun to work with, to bathe everything in red and have occasional lightning flashes. One of the things that they discover is this here We've established it before, and the hourglass has finally shattered, and we see the sands of time have spilled out. Subtle. I know. I was like, will people get this reference? This was also really broken because we couldn't afford rubber copies of this hourglass, so for all the times that Delos previously knocked it off the stand, there was somebody catching it on the floor, and then we finally got to break it for this. I think our art department had a real blast going through and just tearing down everything and destroying the sheets and really, really going to town on this room. Whiskey, nailed it. So we got the record coming back, playing a distorted tune and the blood on the record. This is very satisfying. So they see a blood trail. Jeffrey goes into a room and finds the technician who had previously been in the antechamber is dead. And then we hear first before we see it, that same screeching sound. We have the pedals once again here. You know, I think so much of horror 
is about this mood of dread, building dread. You know something terrible is going to happen, but you don't know what yet. And so, you know, we introduced Delos for the first time as just feet and pedals. This time, of course, Delos is pedaling backwards, and the room looks very different. You have a sense that everything is going to be completely batshit, which it is. <laughs> The fight in this scene was choreographed. You know, it's, it's a small fight. There are bigger fight sequences in this. But we did talk a lot about the motion of both hosts. You know, we haven't seen Jeffrey be violent in this way before in, a, in any sort of protracted battle. And Delos, too, you know, you realize at this point that they are both machines in their bodies. And so their movements are a little bit stilted and incredibly precise in the way they fight. It's not like a street brawl. And then comes the sort of finale of the scene. The way this scene was initially scripted, their encounter was nowhere near this close. Um, they basically fought him, and this dialogue occurred from a distance when once Jeffrey's uh, had helped Elsie to her feet and gotten from the room. And it was kind of the swan song of Delos delivered from afar. But one of the great joys of directing is when you're watching a performance to leave room for something really fresh to emerge totally organically. And that's what happened here. I saw this connection between Jeffrey and Peter and was thinking about the ways in which that last speech would be so much more intimate if they were close. This idea that potentially in his insane state, he's glimpsed something that might actually ring a little more true. Um, we love reducing it to these almost sort of biblical terms that he'd be wrestling with the infinite. They said there were two fathers, one above, one below. They lied. He's referring here and remembering a conversation, but this idea of being under a great volume of water and looking up at it and seeing yourself reflected back down and applying that to the idea of God and the devil and this realization he's had that maybe they're one and the same. That, that maybe this, this, this vision that we have of a, of a sort of shining deity who will, who will rescue us is, is actually really just the devil standing right next to you or maybe you yourself being the devil. And we like the idea of consciousness like a well or an elevator shaft that you're falling down and this idea that sanity, or the state of consciousness that most people exist in most of the time, is potentially actually a sort of a, an envelope that you live in that protects you, that, that kind of guards you from looking at the, the actual state of the world. And that if you push through that, if you went further down and further down, you'd eventually get to a place where you saw the world for what it really is. And that would be a truer state of consciousness, something that most people would look at and comfort themselves by saying is insanity but might actually be a vantage point from which you see the world, yeah. life, and, and, uh, and consciousness for what it really is. I was only ever the devil. I went to the God from the water. It was just this reflection, laughing like that in The entire season has been questioning the idea of good and evil and whether people are simply heroes or villains, or whether different circumstances can you know, elicit different behaviors or show different sides of a person's character. And I loved playing with the notion of these you know, Dionysian souls trapped in this episode and subverting the traditional you know, posturing of good versus evil. You found this intimacy between these two characters, you know, where literally Delos is talking about mirroring and the idea of, you know, it was, it was only the devil looking up at me. And these two men are positioned in this way where they're mirroring each other. They're having a moment of actual connection, a moment of connection that will later kind of haunt Jeffrey's character as he steps outside and realizes what part of this conspiracy he was complicit in. It's, you know, redemptive in a way, I think, for Delos, this final confession. He almost becomes you know, a pathetic figure that you, you feel sorry for. You see his humanity and his tragedy at the same time. And I think Jeffrey does, too. Bernard's character does, too. 
So he went from being this monster in a horror movie to just a human laid bare with all his weaknesses and all his doubts. And those doubts are reflected in Jeffrey's own storyline. There's a beautiful moment. It's not what we scripted, but you yeah, know, you just kind of. I improved it for him. <laughs>